Hi, my name is Manuel Copas, and I'm here to welcome you for our latest podcast or YouTube, whatever you decide to listen this with. With, um, I'm introducing this evening or today a presentation by Professor Natasha Cole and Professor Luis Thomas, both from the University of Westminster. Their interventions are going to be quite different. Uh, in particular, the one that we're having from Professor Natasha Cole, she had an episode of cyberbullying, and she's going to explain to us how it happened and how sometimes actually something that is fake can become reality. For in the, in the second part of this uh, session is going to be led by Professor Louise Thomas from Westminster and she's going to be talking about data science analysis, particularly images and fat in human bodies using UK Power Bank individuals. So this is part of the London Mathematics Meetup. We have these meetups every month and I look forward to the next one when it happens here in London. So all the best. I hope you enjoy it. One of the first times when she's going to be able to talk about it. So I'm, I'm not going to say more than that. So we're going to have um, our college research director. Did I get it right? Uh, Professor Miriam Dweck. She's going to give us a little introduction about Westminster, the college. Um, so it's a great honor that, that you will open this meeting. And then we'll have Professor Luis Thomas. She's the actually director of research for the School of Life Sciences. And then if there is any time whatsoever, then uh, you have to bear me for, for a few moments. Uh, other than that, I just want, uh, um, Kevin said, you know, he was looking for um, brain popcorn. I'm not sure. Uh, I hope you get some of that. Um, and with that, uh, thank you guys for making the effort to come. I, it's really, really great to see you all. Uh, I know that you know you have to be um, slightly obsessed with uh, science to, to be able to come uh, at this time. So um, over to Professor Miriam Dweck. Thank you. Thanks so much, Manny. I, I, I asked Manny if it would be all right to say a few words, really, to welcome you to Westminster, because I don't know how many of you have been uh, to the University of Westminster before, and so I just wanted to, to say a few words, tell you a little bit about our organization, and hopefully um, set the scene for what will be very fru fruitful collaborations between many of us and, and you. So um, we were the first ever Polytechnic in London. Um, we received the Royal Charter, if you're a royalist, that will mean uh, a lot to you. Um, but we received the Royal Charter and our flag flagship campus is on Regent Street. So we really are in, in the absolute heart of London. Um, and, and that was opened in 1839, so nearly 200 years ago. So we've been around for a while. Um, and then we, after, after a while, we became known as the Polytechnic for Central London. And any of you who are around in the 70s and 80s will remember those days um, with much, uh, much, much love. And we were always known for being a little bit cutting edge um, before we became the University of Westminster in 1992. Um, I thought I'd just share with you a little snippet from our prospectus, apparently, from 1839, which, in which it said, we will be an institution where the public, at little expense, may acquire knowledge of the various arts and the many branches of science. And that we still do that. I don't know if we're still at little expense. You might have to ask some of our students and doctoral researchers for that uh, insight. Um, but in, nine, in 1847, so going back, yeah, a long time, um, we started holding evening classes. And I suppose we're carrying on in a great tradition this evening, learning, we're going to learn a lot um, with, with Manny's evening class uh, tonight, particularly in the subjects of engineering, science, and other technical subjects for young, or not so young, working Londoners. 
Um, the building you're sitting in, it's very uh, much in the brutalist style that was in the 1960s, late 60s when it was built. Um, some of my colleagues are horrified to learn that it's a listed building because it's one of a type. Um, and, and it's considered, you know, very, very much um, uh, of that brutalistic form that was in the early, uh, early 70s. And basically, staying true to our original aims, we, we still have the aim of making a difference for those who normally wouldn't have an opportunity to, make, uh, to, to learn and to, to make a difference with them and for them. So we're, we're staying true to our original strategy. And I think the title of this event about equity, diversity, inclusion in this very, really, really in important topic speaks to that. And it's something that I think is really, really pertinent to this day. So I think um, we've got a long back history. We're really looking forward to the future. We know that this is the future. We're, it's here, it's now, and it's going to keep moving forward. Um, it comes with a lot of challenges. Um, and diversity is probably one of the key challenges, actually. Um, diversity and, and, and the impact that that has on our lives, on other people's lives, if it's not embraced effectively and properly. And I think we're going to hear from my colleague next, who's going to explain her insights. Um, but just to say, this topic is needed now more than ever. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you and thank you for being here today. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Manny, Miriam. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that I'm so deeply grateful to those of you, especially from outside the university. We have the best colleagues ever because they really are there for you at a difficult time, and I am supremely grateful. Uh, and uh, so initially, when, I mean, I was at this bioinformatics uh, meetup when, the last time that I was here. We were talking about, uh, you know, the usual sorts of things. And in fact, uh, I had a conversation about how uh, you know, within the UK context, the, since the ancestral data, you know, of people who haven't lived here for generations is not always captured in the same way within medical records, how that poses a problem or could pose a problem for risk assessments. So that's the sort of thing I was talking about. And when I signed up for this, I was super excited. I had no idea that this was going to be the social was going to be, you know, the social and the science, the, the social was going to kind of you know, announce itself uh, so strongly. But, uh, you know, but uh, I, I've resolved through this whole whatever last six days to kind of get through everything that I've committed and then tomorrow I'm on leave. But, uh, okay, so here's what's going to happen. I'll very quickly tell you what happened because then I'll draw your attention to where you can know more about it because it actually has a link to things like equality, diversity, inclusion, and AI and data science. And then I'll talk to you about a few other things that may refer back but that are probably closer to... Um, what you talk about. So while I do this, while I look for the thing that I want to show you, uh, I'm going to simultaneously like physically do this, but tell you that, you know, as a social scientist, I am, um, my work is fairly critical interdisciplinary. So I have published on say explainability and, um, and AI and how the two main problems that we face with AI, one relates to biases and the problem of ethics and the other is explainability. How, you know, explanation has posed a challenge for, uh, for AI, and that's why we talk about XAI, but that in fact there are other sorts of um, governing logics, say for example economics, where explanation again is, is a complicated matter. So I have worked on that. Um, and the critical interdisciplinary work that I do, the three thing, things that tie underneath all of it, that, that are the, the kind of underlying thread, is relation, a focus on relationality, on marginality, and on entrenchment. So, you know, how do we look at things a different way if we look at how things are related to each other rather than discrete or siloed? Um, what is, um, how, do, how do things entrench themselves as common sense? How do certain kinds of patterns of beliefs entrench themselves as common sense? And uh, marginalization, so, or, uh, sorry, marginality, which is that you can get a better perspective of a system often from its outside than from the inside in, obviously, because you're not sharing the foundationalist assumptions. So, I don't know if Twitter normally shows you um, but basically, later, you can go here and you can read everything that I have. Okay, so it doesn't. Unless I'm logged in, it won't show you. Uh, in which case, 
you know, that's the Twitter handle, but if I just, and I, again, oh, this is an interesting experiment, because if I do it on my computer, let's see what it shows up here. So yeah, it shows up fairly similar things. So you can see that uh, I've been in the news, um, all over Indian news, all of, you know, BBC, whatever. It's basically because um, I, because of my work, I, I assume, because I was given no official reason. So I was due to attend a conference in India on Saturday and Sunday. I was invited by the state government in Karnataka, which is a Congress-ruled state, which is not the party at, at power and center. I had the official invitation. I was due to, I, I was to land on Friday, leave on Monday morning. It was a busy time, so it was just two days. I landed there, went through a whole lot of hell. I was refused permission into the country. I was held in detention for 24 hours under pretty uh, harrowing circumstances and deported back to the UK. I, I have been given no reason for this whatsoever, uh, except the only reason they said, one informally official said that you've been critical of the RSS, which is a right-wing group, so maybe you should also read about the RSS in India, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, but it's the ideological parent of the current ruling party, and it's a nationwide organization, uh, and uh, so and, and a far-right nationwide organization. So that was sort of the, the informal thing, but formally I was given no reason. I was simply told this is orders from Delhi, state government. So what if you have a state government official invite letter or whatever? This is orders from Delhi, we'll not allow you in. Uh, anyway, so that happened, and since then, the other interesting thing, which is how it links to the AI data, and actually, while I was at immigration, I first thought they'd made a mistake. I said, have you done some kind of AI thing? Are you using some model by which you're making this decision, which could be totally flawed? Trust me, I know a little bit about AI, and they said no. Um, but since then, what has happened over the last several days, continuously since Sunday, because after coming back to the UK when I was safe, I posted publicly about it, and you'll be able to see it on Twitter in detail. But since then, there has been a relentless onslaught of the most horrible kinds of trolling, uh, graphic sexual rape and death threats, and very, very kind of violent images as well, which you will see uh, when, when you log on to Twitter. But anyway, so the whole point of this is that this, echo, this, this amount of data that is now being generated online that is going to live there forever, who knows what kind of machine learning will be drawn from that data, which is like, you know, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of tweets done by an IT cell, a troll army that, you know, some of whom might be acting even from paid incentives rather than just malice. But all of that data, and this is where I'm going to link back in here and then go to my paper, is that all of that data is going to live online. I have physically, as you will see online, I have physically tried to push back against allegations. I am not married to a Pakistani. If, I, if in my work I have talked about democratic erosion, I have talked about the rise of the right wing globally, I have talked about links between misogyny and authoritarianism, I have talked about the rise of the right wing in India, but also I have criticized lots of other countries and lots of other political projects that follow a similar sort of, uh, you know, um, trajectory. Um, Trumpism, Bolsonaro, Duterte, um, you know, you name it, I, I've talked about that. So it's not uh, Tibet, I've talked about, you know, Hong Kong, I've talked about Afghanistan. It's, it's as a social scientist, that's part of my job. So, but as, a, as an individual person, even with some amount of following, when I push back, I can only correct certain kinds of very basic facts. I, what I can't do is match that with the level of information and data that's being generated that will live there forever, which is systematic, massive, and it's just constantly repeating the same old lies. There have been news reports saying, as, as pathetic as I have to say, I'm not married to a Pakistani, I'm not a jihadi, I'm not a Western British intelligence agent, I don't work for the CIA. But but the, the thing, you know, for, for a few days, like for the initial point, I was just like maddened by it. But then I thought, hold on, this actually also stays on the internet. So there's just all of this amount of information on Twitter, which is lies and bullshit and comprehensively, completely false. And I like challenge everyone online. Like even my, if you go on academia.edu, I have a 60 page CV, which is all public, including every single thing I've ever done and said and been at. And this will actually also get added onto it. So it's, it doesn't have to have a basis in fact and evidence. It's just there. So as a human being, when I talk to you, you get the point, you understand why this is problematic. Will a model that's learning from that data understand that when it gives the answer that most amounts of people think that, or it has been said that? So that's that's the other kind of second thought that I had about it. Um, so uh, apart from my Twitter, and before moving on to the next bit, uh, I will also just very quickly request you that 
if you could, uh, because uh, some of the very kind of blatant, um, the government went, uh, you know, leaked information to a national TV channel. So there have been these TV channels that have been doing interviews with six panelists about my deportation without anyone reaching out to me. And using fake quotes that are plastered on the TV channel, which are not my words. It's, it's like that staggering, which, which all of which I refute in, the, in this interview, which is the only interview that I've done, which is this one. So if you get a chance, it's 40 minutes. I'm not going to play it now, but I just want you to know that it, it literally was that basic. I'm an overseas citizen of India. I'm a UK citizen, but I hold an overseas citizenship of India. So it, it isn't like I had a visa, like all my documents were completely valid. <clears throat> anyway, and the internet, the right-wing ecosphere is calling for is saying I'm a violent terrorist, I ought to be arrested, and of course the fact that unknown gunmen will come and get me. So, um, so it's a grim world we live in. But what's, what's the general thing that if I reflect in whatever capacity I have right now to reflect, what's, what are the general things we can draw from it? I think one thing is that as we, as technology, as we move forward with the increasing role of technologies and in what technologies can do to curate our understanding of social realities and amplify certain kinds of things but not others, one important thing to think about is the role of national jurisdictions in that, and the other is what is its intersection with nationalism and a particular kind of pernicious nationalism as a force. Now, so on, um, I need the classes for this, on the 26th of February, so that's only three days ago, The Guardian did an article um, about uh, Google, about uh, Google being pushed back uh, you know, by uh, India for it has a program called Gemini and that program, when you ask that program, and this is again for whatever, whoever troll later listens to this online, this is all online wherever the camera is, this is all online all factual, but basically the the uh, the, the, pro, uh, the the AI tool so I could actually show you uh, answers when asked about uh, is Modi a fascist, they gives a particular answer which is that there are certain kinds of policies which include targeting minorities etc and believe me you, you want to know more about these kinds of political projects. So uh, it gives a certain answer that the government was not happy with. So it said to Google your answers of your AI tool are anti-Indian, you need to change them and I, I think as I understand from um, this um, Google said sorry and changed the answers or something. So here, uh, Gemini, India confronts Google over Gemini's AI tool. So what I'm thinking, you know, there's something called anticipation studies. So if you think about like what's going to happen five years later, if, if a lot of strongmen, if a lot of these or more of, of such strongmen leaders come to power in countries, in large countries, what, what sort of status of fact would we be remaining with if technologies, including the answers given by technologies, can be manipulated in this way? So, so that's, that's the thing I wanted to start from, but also to say that therefore the social, you know, even if we think we are working within the realms of AI or data or whatever, the social continues to be very relevant. And science and technology studies, so if you think about, you know, um, my favorite historians of science, Shapin and Schaefer, who said questions of knowledge are also questions of social order. And indeed they are. It's, it's kind of deeply connected. I am fundamentally a techno-optimist, but increasingly I think I feel like a techno optimist which is a term from Gramsci, when uh, you know the the, the uh, it, uh, uh, you know the Italian thinker, who said that what we should have is pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, and I think that it's I think I'm changing my, my view to being a pessimist optimist when it comes to uh, when it comes to algorithmic decision making, uh, and and it's not just that you can de-bias the algorithm; it's also the fact that even down to the if you go prior to that, even to the design of the algorithms. It's, it's at that level that we need to be thinking about it. So you can't just get fairness through unawareness, uh, as, some, you know, as, as some people seem to think. For me, while there are really good ways in which um, you know, um, uh, AI can actually help social justice concerns, and people often, you and often talks about you know, the role of digital tech in SDGs, etc. But I think there are certain serious things to think about at when especially we think about the intersection of technology and democracy. One, I mean, the obvious one is the discriminatory responses. Uh, you know, we have examples of AI being used in court, in sentencing decisions, AI in prisons in the US, and all sorts of problems, like well-documented research about how that doesn't work and how that's problematic and how the debiasing strategies don't always uh, do what they're supposed to. The big one is elections and disinformation, a psychology, Science, I mean, it's kind of like political psychology veering on science paper that, um, that I saw um, before this, so maybe like 10 days ago. 
was talking about does AI disinformation actually matter, AI generated propaganda actually matter in electoral outcomes and they found that it comprehensively does. So, uh, so you know, I think as we think, as we think ahead, the polit of, at the politics technology intersection, then, you know, then electoral outcomes are, are, are one to think about. And, and although, of course, substantive democracy is not just about elections, and there are other ways in which procedural democracy can be undermined, uh, but, but it's still important. Uh, I already mentioned machine learning from large amounts of data. I already mentioned um, medical diagnostics. But I think that it is important while we do the very important things as scientists, as social scientists, as academics, while we do the very important things of focusing on specific things, I think it is also, in my view, very important to link, to see the rhizomatic sorts of links between things that we think may not be connected. Because, uh, because uh, sometimes there are those sorts of you know, uh, links, and specifically in, uh, in that in that other paper on AI that I've done, which, uh, you know, towards the end specifically links to these questions, how our trajectories of care, affinity, knowledge about outside of nationalist projects, outside of national jurisdictions is shaped, is, 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 is something to, um, to think about. Because going forward, I don't know, sorry, Manny. Manny was, was like, he was like, no, you must speak. I said, no. I, he said, no, it may be very happy if you speak. So I, I, I you know, I, I want to share, but of course I don't want to, take all the time, is that, you know, what we have to think about is that, is that uh, again, going back to the science and technology studies literature that, you know, uh, there's a quote, there's a, the work of Mumford from 64 that, you know, there are democratic techniques and there are authoritarian techniques. And there is a certain way in which the, the current patterns of, of, you know, of how we think about technology and how we think about the promises of technology can actually entrench authoritarianisms uh, in, in multiple countries. I, uh, I honestly, honestly promise to whoever is watching it, I am not anti-India. <laughs> All right, thank you. Don't go yet. Do, um, so uh, we're going to do this. If, if you're okay, we're going to have one or two questions for... And then, if there is any time, then the three of us, well, or the two of us, whether, then more questions afterwards. Is that okay? Yeah. So let's, let's have one or two questions for Natasha. How do you feel? How do I feel? Um, oh, I don't know. I'm just, I think I'm running on reserve and going from moment to moment. I, I haven't crashed yet, but I'm sure I will. It's just like it's, I haven't literally had even time to... To crash. It's just, I mean, I can't show you. I mean, I probably could, but can I log into my Twitter here? Do you think it's possible? It's because I don't think, I, I think it's pretty incredible. It's, it's hard to imagine the sort of thing, but also the way in which this is systematic and what that means for when that happens within certain jurisdictions. Yeah, should you think uh, for academic purposes, there should be like normalized data where you filter out things and you're, you know, not known in the, the kind of mad. Uh, what do you call it, viral things, like the viral, for example. Hmm. So you're kind of seeing things in a much more perspective hmm. than uh, some do you need to log in? outside hmm. academic network would see. Do you think that could be... Uh, that's, I mean, that sounds like such an interesting way to think about it, and I think that is great, but who will bell the cat? Like, who, who will do the curating of what goes in and what stays yeah, out? <laughs> your your um, email? No, it's your... Um, I think email, it says email username. I think email is... Whatever you use to log in to... Yeah, I use this generally. Twitter. Yes, I use this generally. Uh, next. Thank you so much, Manny. This... Um, Phone number or username? Phone number or username of what? This is like They're not a saying practical that, session. I, I blanked it. I blanked it so oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm saying, so username as in Twitter username, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. I'm actually, ha I've actually had to, not that he will, re not that anyone reads it or responds, but I've actually had to tag Elon Musk to say, why can't you just shut down these accounts? It's so clear that they are in violation of every single principle in every single part of the world. Why can't, why are they still there? Why are you still, um, okay. Let's hope I remember this. Uh, Nepo. Never. Yes, okay. All right, so that's, you can see it on one of the boards. But basically, 
Um, oh, and the, the answer I, oh, today, just today afternoon after my interview, the only reason I've got is that, well, that's that. What are, what are you going to do about it? It's our decision. We don't need to give any reasons. But anyway, so this kind of thing, I mean, why is that not, why is that allowed to be, not uh, even after I report it, so it's not the first time, it's, it's just allowed to be there. They're allowed to continue with doing this kind of shit over and over again. This is a screenshot. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible kind of, you know, um, they're doing it with their names, of course. Uh, gender, so coming to misogyny, see, transitioning to females, it, it really, oh, um, maybe I should, uh, so this, this whole thing just, I mean, the, the hate, but also like the, the details of what happened are in here, the official invitation, so. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. How many of these comments are actually coming from real people, and how many? So I have no, I have no way of knowing, <laughs> but lots of them are real people. Uh, there is, there is. Uh, so I, yeah, the reason. I'm, hmm. You know, these are probably generated by bots. So. Some, but some I don't think so because they actually have accounts where they post about different things, and also Oxford uh, Internet Institute has done work on this. There is such a thing; it's a phenomena called the IT cell. There is literature on it, which means information technology cell. So it's like what in China is called the Fifty Cent Army. So it's organized people whose livelihood, whose whose job it is to be doing this. So it doesn't. It, so it's automated, and then it's people whose job it is, and then of course it's everyone else. So, um, yeah, it's, it's um, th these are, um, these are real, real people. And, and also like mis mis manipulated um, images, selective quotations of text out of context and so on also. I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm the only person this has happened to. Uh, although, of course, experientially when it happens to you, it, it, it is a significant thing. But I'm saying that apart from the kind of the other thing, the, the specific personal experience, there is something to think about how at the politics technology intersection, these kinds of resurgent nativist nationalisms, by the way, in all parts of the world, are going to impact upon what we know, what we can know. There's a person in the back, I think she needs. So we're gonna have one more question and, and then <coughs> next speaker, so. Um, are you considering changing the name to feel safer? My name? Uh, see, so that's the thing. I don't want to be driven out of the public sphere. My point is, I, I mean, there is, I, informally, there is that sense that academics overseas who have, connect, who in return for access to the country can give informal undertakings that they will not be critical. But my point is, that's what my scholarship is. As a politics and international relations academic who also works in other areas, I write about democratic erosion. I feel strongly about the need for liberal democratic values and against authoritarianism. So I refuse to bow out and say that, you know, I'm not, I'm going to change what I say because of this. In fact, what I want to say is that the, the more these kinds of things are understood and worked upon, the, the less, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a positive externality for, for everyone if we have more, uh, more thought on this. So, no, I mean, it's, it's not a, it, I don't know, I guess it sounds a bit strange, but I'm not honestly worried that, if anything, I mean, I'm not worried to, 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 to have anything happen to me. Uh, nobody lives forever. It seems like it did not cross the physical security question, right? Uh, not directly. However, if you read in the thread, there have been attempts to intimidate my family, like my, uh, which is only my, my mum. I'm a single, you know, my, my father's not alive, so it's just my mum. She's elderly and ailing, and so it's easy to kind of, you know, but, but I've made that clear publicly. And in fact, that is precisely why I chose to go public, because I don't think it makes sense to, you know, to just say, well, uh, okay, here's our little conversation, and all right, I'm, you know, let me into the country, and I'm not going to say what I say. Because what I say is peer reviewed. What I say makes sense. I mean, you know, if I, so it's like I just don't see how how like that kind like as a as a scholar it is our job to be critical. So especially in, in my field, it's not I'm not doing it out of like you know some some kind of animus. It it is what I do. I study democracy. I'm the director of the center for the study of democracy. So how can I not write about it? But personally, I mean, what I have done is 
I haven't even logged on to Insta. I don't post there. I don't know what's happening there. I have just chosen to not do that. I've also, because Facebook has long comments, I've not chosen to post every detail there. I've just posted the, the main thing or if somebody's tagged me. So, but, but I think that, I mean, I think this is one of the things with Mastodon and when Elon Musk took over, is that what it caused is also a change of, so lots of people, good thinking people, left, right? So it actually leaves those who have, haven't left more vulnerable. And I, you know, there's, there's ways in which you can think about system dynamics, like what happens, because had, had all of those people stayed, maybe, I mean, it's, it's at the end of the day, as I said, it's also a political choice, like, you know, how, how much you want to kind of stick your neck above the parapet. But if you, if lots of good thinking people leave, then it also leaves that ar arena open. But yes, your question also about automation in bots and how, that there might be different standards for relying upon, just as there is Google and Google Scholar, maybe there could be like a machine learning data and machine learning data scholar. <laughs> that kind of filters out certain kinds of things. So we are not, um, yeah, so we are not at least enrolled into it from the very beginning. So we are going to, first of all, can we just give you a round of applause? <laughs> The way you are listening to us, because yeah, this yeah. is being recorded, if this is not bravery, then you tell me what it is. Oh, no, thank you. <sighs> okay, so um, I got the adrenaline quite high. So um, I guess we're going to go on to the next speaker. So you're going to have a big job. Uh, Luis here. Um, yeah, so Luis, as I said, she is the director of research for the Faculty of Life Sciences at Westminster. And it's a real pleasure to have you. Your presentation was here open somehow. Oh, there it is. There you are. So. Thanks. Thank you very much, Manny. I kind of feel after that I can only be an anticlimax, so I apologize in advance. It's funny, I, I was thinking, have I ever been misquoted? And I was once when I was a PhD student. I got interviewed for the new scientist, and she's this new journalist, and she's speaking to everybody in the department, and everybody got fed up asking, answering her questions. And I was quite patient, because I thought she's interested in fact, this is great. And when the article came out, it quoted me as saying that fat is a marker of intelligence. And I'm actually quite relieved there was no Twitter or anything in those days. I kind of, tangentially, it was actually true, but you'd have to go through lots of steps to get there. But anyway, but Manny very kindly asked me to come and talk to you about um, a journey in data analysis, which I sent to him, and he said, you've got far too many slides. You have to reduce it by, what, two-thirds? So, um, so we've got a very truncated journey in data analysis. So my background is in, um, in clinical and human research. And um, human research is, is one of those funny things. If you think about like, how we need clinical research for medicine, but if you look at medicine, most of the medicines we take today were developed on white populations, not just white populations, generally just white men. So this is a major problem for many of us who's, where the drugs might not be suitable. And one of the issues, one of the reasons for this is like most clinical trial participants are white. But white people often don't bear the burden of disease, which is much more prevalent in other populations. So I'm going to be talking about ethnicity in the study, but in the context of self-reported ethnicity, as in the UK, by about not in a genetic proper... I'm not a geneticist, um, so I, I, so I apologise for the simplification. But my main interest, uh, when I started many, many years ago, was why type 2 diabetes was so much prevalent in South Asian populations. In fact, South Asians in the UK are like six times more likely to have type 2 diabetes than the white population. And at a very low BMI, what we would consider a normal BMI puts them at high risk of developing diabetes. And this isn't just a problem here in, in Southeast Asia. Um, diabetes and pre-diabetes and uh, non-communicable diseases are reaching epidemic proportions. So understanding why there's this 
increased risk is really important. So when, when I first started working in this area, there were all sorts of reasons related to body composition as to why. And it was the fact that South Asians had more visceral fat than white Europeans, or they had more liver fat, less muscle. The muscle was poorer quality. People stored lots of fat inside their muscle cells. There was a reduced... Um, secretion of insulin from the pancreas. And over the years, we've actually looked at pretty much all of these things in adults and in babies. And what we found is if you actually match people for lots of different things, there's no difference in the amount of visceral fat in Asians and white Europeans, and the same for the amount of liver fat. Now, we do see reduced muscle mass, and we do actually see increased muscle fat content, but interestingly, it doesn't relate to insulin sensitivity, which it did in our white populations. Now, one of the difficulties in doing what we were doing is these tended to be on very small, kind of matched populations. They were never big enough to take everything into account. When it comes to these factors in body composition, we know it's not just one factor, it's not just ethnicity affecting something. It's everything to do with lifestyle, how much exercise you do, your lifestyle, your, um, your diet, your socioeconomic status. And with the kind of data sets we had, we just didn't have the power to be able to understand this in any depth. So when the UK Biobank started in 2006, I mean, we really thought this was going to be the, the, the way we would answer all of our difficult questions because um, the UK Biobank had all this information. I mean, I'm not sure, I'm sure you all know about it, but you know, they collect blood, urine, saliva. It's looking at genetic, lifestyle, health information. It's linked to medical health records. I mean, it's an extraordinary resource, but unfortunately, in 2006, this ambitious project, very, very basic physical measurements. We're talking about weight, height, waist, hip. So for us, it wasn't very going to um, help us anymore. But then in 2014, the UK Biobank had a revolution and they started imaging people. So there's a whole imaging protocol that was um, planned. They were going to be doing brain scans and heart scans because obviously those are the only two important parts of the body. But then they got in touch with us and said, actually, there's this thing in between called the body um, and we might include that too. So we were really excited. I mean, this, this was going to change the world for us. Um, due to costs, obviously, and practicalities, it was impossible to really do this on half a million people. So the plan was to MRI scan uh, 100,000 people. So at the Hammersmith, we did develop this brilliant protocol where we measured how much fat people had, where the fat was stored, the liver, the muscle, everything. It took us an hour. We scanned people really thoroughly, and the eco buyback said, right, you've got nine minutes. Um, so we had to kind of rethink the way we did everything. So we had, we used to do kind of like spectroscopy, which is a very accurate but not very portable or convenient method. So we developed like new imaging methods. So we take a single slice through the, through the liver and we could look at how much fat and iron was in that slice. We do the same for the pancreas. We had uh, another little, little single slice for looking at pancreas volumes. And then we had this scan from the neck to the knee. And at the time, I think we only really envisaged that we were going to measure fat, how much subcutaneous fat had got on the outside, this fat in blue, and visceral fat, the kind of bad fat um, for disease in the, um, in the middle. But I don't really think we'd given too much thought about how we were going to analyse our data sets. So at the Hammersmith, I analysed everything manually. It took me a day to analyse how much visceral fat somebody had. You know, that was like eight hours without talking to anyone. It was a very time-consuming thing. So how we would scale up was, was quite, quite the conundrum. So it took me a day to analyse kind of one measurement in a person. And now we had these kind of data sets where we actually thought, well, actually, we want to measure lots of things. We're not going to restrict it just to fat. We'll do muscle. We'll do all sorts. And then we calculated it would take about 14 days per person to analyze everything. Now, at the moment, we've got 74,000 data sets. So you can imagine if I was just sitting with my computer drawn around everything, it would take me you know, thousands of years. It's not very practical. So scaling up from the kind of study I do to one of these very large um, biobank studies was a problem. So the answer was um, deep learning. And now we've now developed a system where we can analyze each person's data set in 20 to 30 minutes. So if we're running it on our computers here at Westminster, this still takes us months, but we're working with um, a large company in America who, who kind of run this analysis for us, so it's much quicker. So what did we have to do? Well, we. I'm not sure, is there a cursor? Yes, here. Yeah. So uh, we took the, uh, there we go. 
So we take the images as they come out of the UK buyback. They don't actually come out as knitted together images. We have to kind of combine them together. This process can sometimes call errors, called swaps. We've, so we've come up with lots of automated ways of putting the data back together and getting rid of all of the errors. And then what we do, we have to train our models. So we, we go back to our manual annotation. If I wanted to, say, come up with a liver model, I would measure liver volumes manually in, say, 100 people. And then we train our deep learning models, and it produces uh, a liver volume. Now, I have to be completely honest that from the beginning, I said, this is never going to work. No way is AI or machine learning going to replace what I can do by looking at it. It's not going to be accurate enough. And I have to say, I was very glad to be proven wrong. And it's really quite impressive, the quality of the data. Because although we can't visually check all 74,000, we do actually do quite a lot of visual checking to make sure the data is sensible. And now, so instead of just the fat, if you look at what we're able to measure, it's pretty much everything. So these... The, this is some of our repertoire. We've got some new things that um, aren't up there yet. But we can automatically measure almost all of the major organs. So we can look at the kidneys, liver, lungs, spleen, pancreas volumes. We can look at heart volumes. We've got um, a very clever way of looking at cross-sectional area of major um, a, um, arteries and veins. We can look at substructures. We can look at all the different bits of the kidney. We've got methods for looking at the shape of organs and how shape changes in relation to disease. And then we can bring in diseases and see if you've got type 2 diabetes, does that accelerate changes in the liver, which it does. A little spoiler. We can look at our, our fat volumes. We can look at how much fat is stored in our muscles. We can look at muscle volume. We can't look at the whole body. Remember, we're not actually scanning the whole body. We miss the head and we miss the uh, calves and arms. But we get the majority of muscles. And we get these kind of really important muscles, like the psoas muscle, which is kind of one of our core muscles, which is actually extraordinarily related to disease. You can, look at, you can actually look at psoas area and you can predict people's response to, um, to treatment. Will they survive intensive care? It's a really important outcome of health. We can look at um, our muscles holding up the spine. We can actually measure all our bone volumes. We can look at the curvature of the spine. We can come up with what's called a cob angle, and we can see how the cob angle varies. And then we can look at how much fat and iron is stored in all these different organs. And it's quite exciting, going back to what I did many, many years ago with a different method, we can look at the, the fatty acid composition of adipose tissue and relate that to lifestyle factors. So we really can measure pretty much everything in the body. So what have we learnt? Well, quite, quite a bit. I mean, we, we can actually look at all sorts of things. So, I mean, this is from one of the first papers we published with these methods, where all we're doing we, here is looking at basically um, age-related changes in the liver and the pancreas, and we can see how fat increases um, more or less continuously in the liver, but it kind of plateaus in, um, in the liver in people. So we can look at male-female differences. We can even look at diurnal variation. So these are the, people come to the biobank. The biobank operates a bit like a factory line with continuous scanning all day. And we can see that people scanned early in the morning. The liver is bigger than the liver will be at lunchtime, and it recovers later in the day. This fits in with phys physiological changes we know, um, related to kind of glycogen and all sorts of things in the liver. Is it important? Well, maybe for personalised medicine. It might be, might not be. It might just be an interesting finding. But we can start looking at things in a lot of depth. But obviously, more importantly, we can look at our IDPs and compare them with health outcomes. And here we've got, in the beginning, these were the kind of major organs. And we can do a kind of a FIWAS analysis where you're looking at these organs in relation to multiple um, uh, diseases and different disease systems. And some things are, you know, what we know already, we're, we're, we're reaffirming, we've got like a really strong relationship to the amount of liver fat and type 2 diabetes and other types of liver disease. And then if we go back to um, the fat, which is obviously my favourite bit of the body, we can find that the subcutaneous fat, the fat on the outside of the body, we know is metabolically not that active um, in many ways. It mostly relates to things like gallbladders. It's not kind of involved in that many disease processes. But if we look at the visceral fat, that's the fat on the inside around our organs, it's pretty much involved in every different disease process in the body type to diabetes, hypertension, but it really is um, closely involved in lots of different types of disease. 
Obviously, a data set of this magnitude is where the geneticists all get very excited. And in this study, we found 92 independent GWAS signals. Um, it's quite interesting how many things the spleen relates to. I always think of the spleen as just something that gets removed after car crashes. But it's actually it's quite important, it turns out. So, um, and, and it's very exciting. I mean, I'm not going to go through um, all, all the genetics. But one of the important points is when we, we, we wrote this paper and um, we were preparing it, in all the kind of phenotyping sections, it's on the entire cohort. But when it came to the genetics, the geneticists only ran this on the white British cohorts because they said it was too few of the other groups for it to be useful. Which is terrible, because if you do have you know, a SNP or a genetic association, you know, if I want to look at you know, why do people have risk of diabetes, is there any ge uh, genomic predisposition, I've got this massive data gap because they're not running the analysis in these people. So, I mean, I was very confused by this. And we said, like, you know, why, is there, why is there such an unbalanced unpo population in the UK biobank? And if you look at, um, this is the self-reported ethnic background, you can see that it's pretty much all white with kind of small numbers in all of the other groups. Now, I kind of seen, well, you know, it's just terrible recruitment. And, you know, I know from running my own clinical studies, it can be really difficult recruiting the people you want. So we often used to try to beg people who had South Asian groups or Afro-Caribbean groups, can we kind of use your cohorts? But people tended to protect them like their, their little babies. They wouldn't. So it's very difficult to broaden your cohort um, in some respects. But the UK Biobank, actually, they contacted 9.2 million people to be volunteers for the UK Biobank. The only requirements were that you, you were kind of registered with the NHS and you lived within a certain distance of an assessment center. So they weren't particularly targeting the recruitment, apart from the fact you had to be aged between 40 and 69. And the funny thing is, if you look at the census of the time, so this is, these are census values of people aged between 40 and 69. You see, the UK Biobank was 94.6% white British. But then the census in the same period, in the same age group, was more or less the same. So the UK Biobank was actually representative of that population of that time, which makes you think when you're designing a study, do you want a population that's representative of the population, or do you want a population that gives you the power to do things? And I think that that's a very different way of thinking about how you recruit. Because if you look at the new, is it the All of Us study? If you look at their recruitment, they, they've taken it off the internet now, but their original um, thing about targeting recruitment was, again, it's going to be more diverse and represent the population. And their numbers are very similar to UK Biobank numbers. So you will end up with a representative population, but it's still not help allowing us to answer the questions we need. The other option you've got is you go and take, you know, FinGen, you know, all these other databases around the world, except for the kind of work I want to do where I want in-depth phenotyping, none of them have it. You're going back to BMI, waist, hip. So, very difficult. I don't know what the answer is. I just know there's lots of problems. So, what did we find in the days? Well, we, we found lots of things. I mean, it's very exciting. You know, we find, you know, if we're looking at muscle in depth, we find like people um, with sarcopenia had reduced muscle volume. Frailty is associated with poor muscle quality, so that's kind of like fatty muscles. Does this help me answer the question about South Asians? Well, no, because again, we don't have the numbers. And we, we came up with a really cool way that we can take the images and automatically detect um, aortic cross sectional area. Now, we can use this, and we've been able to come up with a prognostically determining who is going to develop an aortic aneurysm. Now, all the code and things that we've got from this are kind of freely available. So you could roll this out in the NHS and say, look, you know, you can screen everybody for free, anybody who's had an abdominal scan. And then one of the other things we did was... Um, we measured spleen iron. I mean, I, I actually thought this was going to be a point of study because I couldn't see why spleen iron was particularly interested at the time. 
I mean, it was cool. It was the, the, the biggest ever measure of spheline in a population. And the geneticists did get really excited because um, there's this condition called hereditary spherocytosis, and nobody's ever really understood why some people have a very severe phenotype and some have a very mild. But from some of the genetic factors they identified, they were able to explain this. So, um, so one of the companies we work with is quite excited, and they're looking into this. But one of the interesting asides in this study is we, we looked at, uh, we, we actually looked at spin iron by um, self-reported um, ethnicity. And you actually had much higher levels of spin iron in people who are self-reported Chinese compared with the other populations. It's kind of hidden away in a supplement a, a paper because the kind of the American people we work with, they feel that if you are reporting a difference, it's almost like in a negative way and it'll be picked up as a racist thing. But I kind of think it's important to look at differences because it might help us why people have a higher burden of disease. I think we have a very different way of thinking about we're not looking at this as a bad thing, but it's like, can this explain disease mechanisms? Might not. But... We're in this weird situation where we're comparing 32,000 people in one group against 100 people in another group. So it's very difficult to make any proper conclusions from that. So where did my journey end? I am ending my journey from Manny to speak. So UK Biobank doesn't really have diversity in sufficient numbers to answer my questions. But compared with any other database, it's streets ahead in terms of depth of phenotyping. And I think this is part of the problem. Lots of, lots of the databases that are brilliant for genetics, they really don't have any depth of phenotyping. So you're relating these kind of really sophisticated methods back to very basic and often sort of badly measured or self-reported measures. So something to think about. But where I think the, the biobank really um, ticks all the boxes in EDI is access to data which when you compare it with um, lots of the big American data sets where you know, companies can't get access, the German biobank where non-Germans can't get access, you know, this, anybody around the world can apply and get access. And if you're from a, a developing country, you can get like, money towards analysing the data. So I think this is the most, most of the democratic um, biobanks, even if it doesn't answer everything. Now... What makes it even more democratic is everything we do, we give it back to the UK Biobank so people can apply to use our measurements. There is a slight lag between us returning it and being available. But if you want to look at visceral fat, liver fat, in relation to your genetics, it is all there now. So I would just like to thank the team because obviously this kind of work doesn't happen with a, a huge group of people and obviously Calico, who sponsor our work, are instrumental. And then I'm just leaving you with this little gem that 60,000 people have been re-imaged in the UK Biobank, so no, it's not just going to be cross-sectional, it'll be longitudinal, which will be very exciting for our research. Anyway, thank you. One question. Kelly. Sparked all sorts of interest for me. I've always I've long been interested in the diversity of data kind of movement on that. And I got particularly interested in these like migration patterns because, so for example, if you grow up in Japan and you have a certain diet and then you move to like Canada or the US or something and everything changes, your environment changes, and that are the physiological differences that might, that might manifest in you. Definitely. Uh, many years ago, I went to a conference in America, and there was this fascinating study where this group had looked at um, Chinese children and looked at their body fat, and they had compared uh, chi uh, rural Chinese, urban, and, and Chinese families who'd moved to America and compared body fat content in comparable children. And it was completely different in, in the way you'd expect. The, the kind of Chinese children in America had much higher body fat. So I think... It is kind of that kind of classic environmental change when you suddenly move into kind of you know fast food plenty and you know everybody's driving compared with say more um, um, rural environment. So, and, and this is one of the problems we've had because we've tried to like when we when we did these uh, studies in babies, we found it very difficult to recruit newborn South Asian babies. Whereas surprisingly, 
quite extraordinary numbers of people would give us their newborn <laughs> white babies and just let us take them from the neonatal unit for a quick MRI scan, which when I think about it, before I had children, I thought, this is great. And then after I had children, I thought, how did you do that to your child? <laughs> but, um, so we, we did lots of studies where we compared them with um, a cohort of babies in Pune in India, Pune, um, at where they've got the most fantastic cohort there. But then, are you really comparing like with like it in so many different ways. It becomes really difficult doing these studies. The other thing I was going to say that the idea of reaching out to minority, sort of minority segments of the population, say the UK, to get more, to get a minimally statistically viable sample, uh, there's a lot of benefit for that. Not only for the fact that you then have them uh, subject to access to the same kind of things, like scans where they may not get it in another kind of country if, they, if their ancestors came from there, and also Data, data, a uniform data protection regime, where basically everybody has a uniform way of uh, being engaged, consenting, and getting that. We don't have to go so much concerned with drastic differences that might happen. That's really, really interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you.